Check this out, guys. We're surrounded by 50 or so grey-headed flying foxes, the biggest bat in Australia. So stick around, guys. I'm going to introduce you to one of the most important keystone species we have in the Australian ecosystem. G'day, g'day. It's Nick here and welcome to Wicked Wildlife. And as I was saying, we are at a flying fox sanctuary at the moment. There is 200 of these guys in total, spread over a couple of aviaries, who are all being looked after after coming in due to heat stress and a bunch of other things that have led them to come into captivity, needing a helping hand. Now, these guys are a really cool animal. They're actually the largest of our four flying fox species. They have a wingspan of up to a metre long. So they're a pretty big bat. Now, traditionally, these guys are found along the east coast, from Victoria, where I'm based, up the east coast to about Townsville in North Queensland, before they start to get replaced by some of our tropical species of flying foxes. Now, in recent years, these guys have actually extended their range further south and further west. So in Melbourne, where I grew up, flying foxes used to be a rarity. But these guys have started to move into Melbourne and set up permanent camps. Ten years ago, these guys started to appear in Adelaide, here in South Australia, and today there's permanent colonies of them. So these guys are changing their distribution because of a bunch of environmental factors, some of them involving people. In South East Queensland, as much as 96% of their winter flowering trees have been cleared for agriculture. And these guys, they're not going to starve, they've got to move somewhere else. And they've moved into cities where, because we've planted a wide variety of plants, they've got more year-round available food. When you add droughts to this situation, which means less flowering going on at the same time, these guys have had to move somewhere else. The problem with this is, they've started popping up in areas that people aren't used to them, and it makes us sort of think that there's a plague proportion of them, that they're everywhere. But instead, there's actually far less than they used to be. It's just that they've got to come into areas where people didn't necessarily expect them. If anything, they're sort of ecological refugees. As far as numbers goes, it's hard to guess exactly how many of these guys is, but some estimates sit that just under 600,000, and it sounds like a lot. But in the 1920s, early surveys along the East Coast basically estimated that there was populations between a quarter of a million and a million every 40 to 50 kilometres throughout their range. These guys were in massive numbers, and no animal can be in that big a numbers without having some important role in the environment. These guys are no exception. So yeah, while 600,000 sounds like a lot, we're talking about an animal that naturally should be in the millions. Now the important role that these guys are filling out in the wild is these guys are long distance pollinators. These guys can feed in one forest, they can collect nectar on their bodies as they're feeding on flowers and leaves and pollen, and uh, they'll carry that to another forest. And basically it promotes genetic diversity within plants. Plants are no different to people or other animals. We don't want to be breeding too close to each other. On top of this, these guys can carry seeds in some areas from the fruit that they're eating and drop that as they fly around their night. And these guys can travel up to 60 kilometers. So there is no other animal, bees or anything like that that do pollination that can travel the distances in a single night that these guys do. This genetic diversity is particularly important in this day and age with climate change, for example. Let's say we've got a family of trees in one forest that just seems to have that right genetic mutation to put up with drought conditions. That genetics can't get to another forest anymore because there's a city in between. Something like this guy can take the pollen from one forest to another, promote that genetic diversity and give plants and forests and ecosystems a far better chance at adapting to all the changes that ecosystems face today. Now when it comes to what species these guys feed on and pollinate, they're not exactly fussy. They've been recorded feeding on 187 plants out in the Australian wilderness and there is 100 that are heavily reliant on these guys for their pollination. So you can imagine if we lost these guys, it's going to be a big deal. Now throughout that range, it's not like they're only found in one type of habitat. Being from Adelaide through Victoria up to North Queensland, these guys are found from dry eucalyptus forests to rainforests. They live in a very wide range of environments, feed on a wide variety of plants, and they're important in each and every one of them. Now living in the groups that these guys do, in tens or hundreds of thousands, these guys are incredibly social. You hear them chattering and squawking and carrying on with each other. They've got really interesting social dynamics. In fact, these guys live in big camps, colonies, and uh, there's two distinct different types of colonies in many parts of their range. In one part of the year, they've got mixed sex colonies, which is when they're breeding and males will set up little territories which might be a few times his body length on a branch. And he will jostle with any other males that come through and try and keep the girls on his piece of branch. Once the girls are pregnant and babies are born, we've got sort of single sex colonies where the males will be on one side or on the outside, periphery, in the far, the crèche, I suppose, will be in the middle. So these guys change their social dynamic with different times of the year. Now, after all that mating takes place, these guys have about a 27-week gestation. Once they give birth to a single baby, which we call a pup, 
That pup is really entirely dependent on mum. It clings to mum with her fur, it latches onto her nipple with a little milk tooth, and it will be flown on her. It'll hold onto her as she flies around her night for the first couple of weeks of its life. Once it gets too big for that, she'll leave it in what we call a creche, which is where all the other baby flying foxes are hanging out, and she'll return to it each night. What's amazing is she manages to find that baby every night. You could imagine in a group where there's 100,000 flying foxes and they've all left their babies, being able to find yours based only on smell and sound. It'd be like you guys going to the MCG full of nothing but kids all screaming for mum and dad and being able to find yours. It's pretty amazing that these guys can do it and they do it every single night. Now, mum will continue to keep coming back and feeding these babies until they're six months or so and they're old enough to start being weaned. For the few months after that, He'll actually follow her around and learn to fly and learn where he can find food, where he can find shelter, these sorts of things, before he ventures off and lives his life as a flying fox all of his own. Now, unfortunately, as important and interesting and cool as these guys are, they're not having an easy life. Like we've said, with drought, these guys have been really impacted. With deforestation, they've lost a lot of food and they've had to move into uh, residential areas, botanical gardens, things like this. So they've had a hard rap. Another major issue that these guys are facing is the increase in heat waves, the amount of days over 40 degrees in any of our capital cities. Since the 1990s, it's estimated that 25,000 flying foxes have been killed. And that's only the ones that we're basically able to get a count and a reliable statistic on. It's probably much, much more. And when you imagine that something only labels 600,000, we're talking pretty significant numbers. Yeah. Between all these issues that they face, deforestation, habitat loss, heat waves, these sorts of things, we've actually seen a 30% reduction at least in the last couple of decades. So these guys are in a lot of trouble. Fortunately, there is people who are helping out. The wildlife carers that we're visiting, Fauna, South, uh, Fauna Rescue South Australia, they're doing a wonderful job caring for these guys. There's bat hospitals and bat sanctuaries and flying fox carers distributed throughout their whole range. So if you live in an area with flying foxes, the odds are there is somebody in your area doing their bit who could probably use a hand with donations or food or time or labor or something. There is people willing to help. On top of that, if you're at home and you don't know how to help, there's one of our videos we're putting out is five things that you can do at home to help flying foxes. So there's lots of things that each and every person can do to make sure that these guys survive well into the future. So as you can see, these guys are not just important for the ecosystem, they're really cool animals. I'm really appreciative of being able to come here and visit these animals and show all you guys. And the least that we can do is make sure that you guys support these wildlife carers. So if you search Adelaide Bat Chat on Facebook, I'll leave a link in the description. You can find a bit more about the facility doing uh, this, some of the work that they're putting in, and keep all these guys fed and happy until they're ready to be released and return out into the wild. On top of that, if, I, if you have enjoyed this video and you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, etc. And if you want to see us get out and about in the state, visit more facilities and show you more animals, the best thing you can do is check us out on Patreon. It's our Patreon supporters whose their contributions have helped us get out here, visit all these animals and show you animals that I simply couldn't get to at home. So I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope you've learned a couple of things. In the meantime, I'll see you next week. Be nice to wildlife. Have a good one and take care.